Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar organized by Vleva and Minarat. The Urban Waste Water Directive has strongly influenced water policy over the past 30 years. And in the next two hours, we want to take stock of the achievements of this policy and try to look 30 years ahead. Starting from a debate on what kind of urban water systems we need in 2050, we will address necessary changes, topics and points of attention that can be important in the revision of the Urban Water Directive. Questions can be asked through the control panel. This will be addressed in the panel debate or can be answered in writing later on. And I will now give the floor to our first speaker, Ms. Rosenstock from the European Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I understand that my slides are now visible and I see that I sent you the wrong slide deck, but I, I know the content is, is the right one. Um, I had uh, adapted some slides that I've used for a previous webinar for our session today. It is always great to share um, what we are doing with uh, different stakeholders and to hear your views because um, revising such an old directive is of course uh, well, uh, very interesting on the one hand, but it also requires a lot of work and a lot of investments to implement it then afterwards. So it's good to have exchanges in advance of, of changing it so that afterwards we know that we're doing the right thing. We can now skip ahead, go to the first uh, actual slide. Thank you. So I meant to start with this uh, slide to just make sure that we are all are starting from the same perspective that the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive is a core piece of EU water legislation. Um, it has been around since 1991, so it's uh, turning 30 years old um, this year in May. Um, and since then, I mean, since this directive has been adopted, a lot of other water legislation has um, either been adopted or uh, been revised. And everything is, of course, uh, being framed by our big water framework directive, which has also recently been assessed whether it is fit for purpose or not, with the conclusion that it is overall indeed fit for purpose, but that overall implementation of that directive needs to be improved. Um, at the same time, we found that some legislations need improvement, and that's, uh, of course, the Urban Water Treatment Directive, which is the discussion of today. Then also the Groundwater Directive and the Environmental Quality Standards Directive have some aspects that require some partial revision, namely the list of pollutants covered by these directives. And then the Industrial Emissions Directive is also currently under review. And you also see in yellow that some other, um, not that all directive actually, um, directives all are also being currently um, assessed whether they are still fit for purpose. These are the Bathing Water Directive from 2006, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and also the Sewage Sludge Directive, which is of course very interlinked with the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. We can now go to the next slide. The starting point for our work, so for the impact assessment and then the proposal for a new directive is always uh, the, or are always the results of the evaluation. In 2019, we as a commission published a, a long document based on a very long study uh, in which we assessed whether we think the directive has worked or not. And on the uh, left hand side, you see here what kind of lessons uh, we have learned. Um, so we, we think really that this directive has been a very effective tool in achieving its, um, its objectives, namely protecting the environment from wastewater impacts. It is a very simple and targeted instrument. It's a beautiful text of just 20 articles that are rather easy to understand. Of course, uh, the devil is always in the details and, and there, even if it's only 20 articles, it requires some discussions to implement it in the right way. Um, then we also saw that on EU level, the carrot and stick approach has worked actually quite well. What we mean here with carrot and stick is that on the one hand, a lot of EU funding has gone into the implementation of this directive. It's, I think, 58 billion, Euro, uh, billion euros since 2000 have gone into the implementation of this directive, and that's the highest amount for any environmental directive of EU funding that was supported. On the other hand, we also had to use the, the stick quite a bit, meaning uh, using infringement actions, legal action against member states, where we saw as commission that the implementation is lagging behind, or the implementation is maybe not done in the right way. So this is also still ongoing and will continue also now throughout impact assessing this new upcoming new directive. In the evaluation, we also try to assess the benefits that this directive has brought and compare them to the costs. And whilst the costs are quite easy to assess because we simply know 
that uh, well, we need a wastewater treatment plan, we need a collection systems, uh, monitoring, etc. All these are, are quite tangible costs. The benefits are much more diverse and very difficult to, to grasp and then to quantify and monetize. Uh, nevertheless, with the methodology that we used at the time, we found that the benefits definitely outweigh the costs. And I think it's also, it just makes human sense that whenever you ask, do you want your urban wastewater be treated or not? I think most of us would just agree that yes, of course, we want our urban wastewaters to be uh, collected, treated, and our water bodies not be polluted by, by uh, urban wastewater uh, pollutants. On the right hand side, you see what we found as room for improvement meaning the areas where we think we can do more. We also think that this directive is not fit for purpose for, let's say, 2050, the timeline that you have set also for today's discussion. And here we mean with uh, remaining pollution, any loads of urban wastewater that come from stormwater overflows, from urban runoff, but also from smaller agglomerations that are only covered to, to a limited extent by our current directive, and then also individual and other, um, other appropriate systems, so IAS, meaning septic tanks that I often use in, in rural areas, but sometimes also to quite a lot of, quite a high amount in agglomerations where they should not be used probably, and where they should at least be clearer and better monitored and controlled. Then we also think that more can be done in terms of dealing with the issue of eutrophication. Urban wastewater contributes to eutrophication. Of course, this is alongside the pollution coming from agriculture but here we know that from a technological perspective more can be done in terms of nutrient and nutrients meaning uh, nitrogen and phosphorus removal and a number of member states already do that then we also have some newer topics that were not addressed in the old directive these are energy use we know that the current wastewater sector only the wastewater treatment plants actually use one percent of all the energy consumed in the eu 1% might not sound that uh, spectacular, but it's actually the public sector that uses m the most energy of all. Whilst we know that actually wastewater treatment plants can be energy neutral or even be a producer of energy. And I think in light of the European Green Deal, also this sector needs to adapt to, to the requirements. Then of course, sludge management, a very important topic. And uh, as I said, the sewage sludge directive is also currently being evaluated and we probably need to do more and have a better system for sludge management in place in the EU. Then we have governance. Um, the directive contains uh, three very old, well, 30 year old articles, article 15 to 17, on how um, effluents have to be monitored, uh, what kind of reports have to be issued and how to inform the public. And these are based on what was acceptable in the 1990s. So before the internet was as popular as it is today. And here we think with more transparency, with more use of digital solutions, we can do more and be more engaged also with the public who is in the end also the ones who pay for, for all the services. And then lastly, in any good impact assessment, we need to make sure that uh, we are coherent with other legislation. This is of course then the Water Framework Directive as, as the overarching directive, but also others like the Sewage Sludge Directive or the Industrial Emissions Directive. Can now skip ahead. Yes, so that was the, the starting point for our, for our impact assessment. We have announced that we would revise the directive in July last year. That was slightly delayed because of COVID and I think attention in the first half of last year was on very different issues. Um, but we have not been sitting around, we have prepared the impact assessment in quite some detail to make sure that we have a very strong framework in place on how to assess the directive and any policy measures that we suggest to change the directive because we are changing here a piece of law that is 30 years old that led to huge investments and we might need to make sure that whatever comes after is as strong as the old directive, hopefully even better and fit for purpose for, for until 2050 hopefully. So in our preparation phase, we've developed a number of policy measures, so ideas how we can change the directive, and I will talk about some of them uh, in, a, in a second. We've come forward with our consultation strategy, so how we want to involve stakeholders, like today in, in our impact assessment. We have published a roadmap to which um, we have received a number of feedback, which was overall quite positive in the sense that stakeholders and member states alike seem to agree 
that this directive is really due to get some to get a review to be revised and become stronger um, we've worked out the methodology that we want to use we're working very closely with the OECD as we've done already for the evaluation the OECD has developed a benefit methodology for us to assess better this time around the, the benefits that this directive brings and any policy measures that we want to adopt and we have also engaged with a lot of experts so for topics such as which chemicals which micropollutants to take out of um, wastewater or which technologies do exist how much do they cost how much energy do they use how to deal with new topics such as antimicrobial resistance we engaged experts who are now um, informing us how, how we can deal with this best based on their best knowledge and ac uh, academic expertise in terms of data collection as i said before starting point is always the evaluation we got that a lot of information under that exercise but under the impact assessment we also want to make sure that a lot of information comes from the member states and the wastewater treatment plant operators or any other stakeholder who has to deal with our directive because we know for example for the member states that a number of member states go beyond what is required in the directive and this needs to be taken into account if a member state already has a very good approach for example on stormwater overflows we want to learn from that and maybe be inspired by it but we also don't want to take it into account in our baseline so that we know if something is already well dealt with if we do more on eu level that will not lead to much higher costs because it's already being done then a number of stakeholder consultations i will later show a short slide on how you can contribute if you're interested we've already uh, done quite some pieces on what if listed here i think what is important to mention is the old online public consultation we're working very hard on getting it right now translated into all 20 four member state languages of the 27 member states and i hope to get it online in the week of in the end of april so and then it will be online for 12 weeks everybody is invited to contribute there will be a general part that is for for the general public but also for experts and then experts are invited to go further and also reply to the expert part parts where you need some more expertise in the understanding of uh, urban waste watching and then later in the year and but we have already started internally of course now is all the analysis we need to digest all this information make sense of it we will work closely with the joint research center to quantify as much as possible all the impacts costs and benefits that a new directive would bring and then we will draft uh, an impact assessment which will take the form of a staff working document and of course if we deem necessary a proposal for a new directive we can now go one ahead Yes, here are the preliminary ideas for policy measures. As you see, I, I put a little disclaimer on, on the top of the slide. It's just to mention that these are ideas, ideas coming from my team, and uh, we are discussing them still internally. They are all subject to analysis. And also given that I have very limited space to, to put them all together, I've here highlighted the most important ones. In total, I think we are currently discussing 66 uh, detailed policy measures. You will see that in the online public consultation as well. But I, I think it's still worth going through the, the highlighted ones here. So for remaining pollution, meaning stormwater overflows, urban runoff, small agglomerations and individual systems, we are thinking, especially for stormwater overflows and urban runoff, to require integrated management plans for collecting system meaning that especially larger agglomerations that have the means to do so should have a strategic approach how to deal with their urban runoff and their stormwater overflows um, we are also thinking about setting eu standards for stormwater overflows to the extent possible but in particular also for small agglomerations where we could set the standard the, the threshold which is currently at 2000 pe we could go lower maybe to 1000 pe or even lower we know that in some member states it's the rule to deal with all urban wastewater produced there is no not even one threshold that's just a reflection then for individual and other appropriate systems we have similar ideas to have better eu standards in particular we want to have a clearer definition of what is an individual or other appropriate system that's not very clear right now in the directive we also want to improve the the standard the sen standard that is set for iis which has some which is not entirely perfect to what we understand at this stage. We're also thinking about a requirement to say all citizens need to connect where there is already a collection system. So not 
this would not mean uh, in rural areas, but rather in a larger agglomeration, in a larger city, if there's already a collection system, these citizens should collect, connect to the collection system if it's possible, if it's in front of their door. Um, an alternative, an, another policy measure for IAS is to require better inspection strategies so that member states actually control whether these IAS are well functioning, whether they are well monitored, um, or also a registry of IAS so that there is actually an overview of how much, to what extent they are used and how much of the load they are collecting and then potentially also treating. For all of these, we are also thinking about a risk-based approach with derogations. This is probably more for the smaller agglomerations where we could think about saying if your stormwater overflows or if your tiny dwelling here in the countryside or if your few IAS do not pose a problem to reach the objectives of the Water Framework Directive, then we don't have a problem either and, and you would be derogated and exempt from doing more. Um, coherence with other legislation. Here we have two things in mind. It's eutrophication and it's uh, industrial discharges, indirect industrial discharges. First on eutrophication, we are considering prescribing in the directive pre-designated sensitive areas. So we would use the, the information that we have from the Water Framework Directive to say, um, we know that the Baltic Sea is highly, highly eutrophic or the Black Sea. Um, so everybody discharging in that area needs to do more. So we would not leave everything to the member states, but really use reported data to pre-designate some areas uh, in advance. At the same time, we're thinking about generally setting stricter standards for nutrients uh, in the sense that we know eutrophication is a big issue across the EU, and we also know it's technologically possible. Then again, we need to differentiate, of course, between nitrogen and phosphorus, where more is probably possible for phosphorus than for nitrogen. And again, for smaller agglomerations or smaller treatment plants, we could think about a risk-based approach where we could say that if, if meeting the Water Framework Directive's objectives is no problem, um, then we also don't have a problem and not more needs to be done. This is really meant to also drive investments where they are needed and not have a two blanket approach. And then the last two items in this bubble are about industrial, indirect industrial discharges. So here we are thinking about strengthening the requirement for pretreatment if industrial discharges go into the urban wastewater collection system and also having potentially a system of permits for small and medium enterprises because from what we understand what the issue is is that in agglomerations, a lot of smaller medium enterprises actually discharge without necessarily having consent into the collection system, creating then problems also for the urban wastewater treatment plant operators. Then as regards uh, new pollution, here we're thinking about uh, new thresholds for performance indicator substances. So not necessarily having a new long list of priority substances, but really say, if you remove these performance indicators, then we know your, your urban wastewater is quite clean of micropollutants and you don't need to, to monitor each individual substance, but rather have a, have a very comprehensive approach. On top of that, we're thinking about a hotspot approach, which is a bit similar to a risk-based approach, where we know that if, if there is a problem in that area, more action needs to be taken. And then lastly, because we know that any action on micropollutants is very costly, we're thinking about applying the extended producer responsibility, which is already used in the wastewater sector to, to quite some success, also on micropollutants. Then fit for the future, here we are covering energy and greenhouse gas emissions. For both, we want to have some reduction targets, if that's possible. Um, for energy, we think that maybe energy audits could support that as well. And then we would need to distinguish if reduction targets are on EU, uh, sorry, on national level or for per treatment plant, both could be envisaged. And then the two second or, or the two other bullet points are about track and tracing to make sure that the sludge that is actually reused in agriculture is clean. Here we know that some member states have very good practices in terms of tracking the pollution that reaches the collection system and then in the end creates a problem for the sludge. And if they want to reuse the sludge in agriculture, we would need to have such a system in place to make sure the sludge does not create a problem for the environment and human health where, where it is used in, in agriculture. And then, of course, and I think that's also no surprise, we need to think about phosphorus recover, recovery. And maybe, maybe it would be possible either under our directive or the sewage uh, sludge directive to set some minimum phosphorus recovery 
requirements. Um, lastly, in terms of governance, um, we believe that some more planning obligations, such as integrated management plans for your collection system, could be helpful. We also need to consider what are reasonable deadlines to implement all that. Nothing of this can be done within the next two years. It all needs time for planning, time for implementation, for building the necessary infrastructure. So reasonable deadlines need to be envisaged. We also want to update uh, the monitoring and the reporting to whatever is possible with uh, digital means and increase the transparency requirements so that the public is actually well informed about what they pay for. We can now go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, I include this slide because it's, it's important just to, to mention that we, we have lots of ideas in mind and we are analyzing them all and we are consulting all stakeholders on all of them. But we also have to keep in mind some overarching co considerations. I'm starting on the left bottom. Of course, we know that control at source is always preferred. And on EU level, I can assure you, we do a lot. There, there were a lot of strategies now under the Green Deal on chemicals, on pharmaceuticals. There will be a nutrient action plan that will try also to deal with issues at source. At the same time here, we're working on the urban wastewater treatment directive. We think about what can be also on top of it done end of pipe, what needs to be done at the end. Then we will always have to weigh the risk-based approach, which is of course helpful in terms of targeting investments versus EU targets, which are much, easy, much more easily enforceable and often um, not only on, on, on commission level, but also member state level, are much clearer how to do it and, and create less of a headache. So here we need to weigh how, how to do it best, but a, a, a well-defined risk-based approach together with EU targets is probably the, the best approach. So the versus can be maybe be um, renamed into end, a risk-based approach and EU targets. Then we always, always have to keep in mind, is it implementable what we demand in the new directive? And is it enforceable on EU level and on member state level? So can we actually see then also progress in terms of uh, compliance with the new directive? Fit for the future, as I said, nothing is for tomorrow. It's, we are taking a long-term perspective here, 2035, 2050. Um, depending on the policy measures, we are aware that it takes a lot of time to implement these ideas. And we also, in terms of investments, want to make sure that the polluter pays principle is well implemented. That's very important also because we want to be in line with the treaty obligations and the water framework directive and always make sure that invest, investments are done where it makes sense. That's why we also consider the risk-based approach. And then lastly, and in, in the commission we have the, the obligation to always consider the administrative burden that we put on, on the member states and on us. And here we need to reduce it as much as we can as, as always. But we also need to make sure that the data that is necessary to monitor, for example, compliance is available when we need it. So here again, we need to um, balance uh, bo both out. So these are just uh, some overarching considerations that will play into all the analysis that we have to do. Now we can go, I think, to my last slide. Yes. If I hope some of you might be interested in contributing, besides, of course, uh, this today's workshop, to our impact assessment, I invite you very much to contribute to our open public consultation. I've inc uh, included here the link under Have Your Say. This is our um, open public consultation website. As I said, it will start in April, really fingers crossed, but it looks good for April. Then it will be open for 12 weeks. At the same time, we will carry out some targeted consultations of member states and stakeholders. We are organizing also a number of workshops. Um, there is one that was just last week on reporting, another upcoming on sludge and wastewater, which is, in our view, a very important, uh, very important topics, and the interlinkages really need to be um, figured out. We will also discuss costs and benefits as part of the impact assessment, and then lastly, integrated sewer management in May. And then hopefully in September, when we have some preliminary findings, we will organize a larger stakeholder conference. Depending on the COVID situation, it would be either virtual, which would allow, of course, for a broader audience to participate, or what we also hope for would, would be nice to meet again in person so that also somewhat in-depth discussions can take place at the sidelines of, of the conference. I think that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. 
uh, Rosenberg, uh, for your presentation. Um, we now have some time for questions. So if you have a question, you can ask them through the control panel. Um, for now, I see no questions, so I guess the presentation was very clear. Um, but if you have some questions later on, you can still uh, ask them through the control panel and then uh, we will pick them up later on. So for now, I guess we can go on to the next speaker. And I will now give the floor to Steven van den Broek from VMN. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is the presentation in presentation mode uh, with you? Nog gewoon op weergave instellingen drukken, dat het um, ja, en dan het eerste indrukken. Ja, super. Wow. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is uh, Steve van den Broek. I work for the Flemish Environment Agency. And in the next uh, 15 minutes, I will walk you through uh, 30 years of urban wastewater treatment directive in Flanders. And I also give you uh, our perspective for the future. Uh, I'll give you some numbers of the state of the Flemish water courses in a uh, uh, around 1990 in an instance, but I think these pictures summarize uh, pretty good the situation, uh, a situation that could uh, not be tolerated any longer and a catching up operation was uh, urgently needed. Uh, the Urban Wastewater Treatment uh, Directive from 1991 set the standards for this uh, catching up operations. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to uh, explain that in Flanders there are two levels of responsibility with respect to wastewater treatment. There is a local level and a supra-local level. Uh, the Flemish Environment Agency, the VMM, he was responsible for uh, the planning uh, uh, of the wastewater infrastructure and the aligning of the local and the supra-local initiatives to one another. We had uh, two very important instruments for that. First of all, there were the subsidies for the local authorities. And also there was the establishment of the aquafin construction, which led to an acceleration uh, of the building of the supra-local infrastructure. All in all, uh, since 1991, uh, more than 10 billion euros was invested in wastewater treatment and more is to come. Uh, this resulted uh, in a very uh, steep uh, increase of the so-called purification ratio. The purification ratio is the percentage of the inhabitants that are connected to a wastewater treatment plant. And it increased from 25.8% uh, in 1990 to, uh, at this moment, 85.5% which is a, a rather spectacular uh, increase. Also, the discharge points, the points that were not connected to wastewater treatments, they dropped quite steeply in that same period. In this graph, you, you see them divided uh, um, uh, in function of their size. And uh, at this moment, and we are uh, 2020, 2021, we have only uh, the smaller discharge points that are not connected to wastewater treatment plants. All the larger uh, discharge points are connected to wastewater treatment plants. Also, the number of treatment plants has increased very dramatically since uh, 1990 uh, to about uh, 300 installations, more than 300 installations at uh, this moment. Uh, not only the number of wastewater treatment plants has increased, but also the performance of the wastewater treatment plants has increased. And in this graph, you see the um, performance for the uh, uh, five basic parameters. And uh, it's very remarkable that the nitrogen removal, the phosphorus removal, and the removal of the COD 
have uh, um, seriously increased during the last 10 years and a lot more since uh, 1990. Uh, there is a, a point I want to make uh, in consideration to the uh, standards uh, which are taken into the wastewater treatment directive. Uh, at first, uh, Flanders uh, opted for the concentrations approach. In the wastewater treatment directive, you can choose between concentrations or percentage uh, 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 reduction of uh, um, ratios. Uh, Flanders chose for the concentrations. But uh, evaluation within Flanders uh, brought that dilution of wastewater was a major problem that was not addressed by working only with concentrations. So we uh, changed from concentrations to concentrations and removal uh, rates. And by this, uh, the problem of dilution was taken seriously uh, and also the separation of polluted and non-polluted water. Of course, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And I'll show you some uh, results uh, of, of measurements in the water courses. There are some chemical parameters. The, the most relevant are phosphorus and ammonium. The phosphorus parameter you can see here, plotted out from 1990 to uh, uh, the uh, 2020, 2021. And we see a, a, a very steep uh, decrease of the uh, average phosphor uh, uh, concentration and even more about the, of the maximum phosphor concentrations that are um, measured in the water courses. Um, today we have a stabilization around almost uh, around the uh, target value. Also for the uh, chemical parameter of ammonium, we see the, the same uh, graph, the same type of graph, a very steep decrease. Uh, reaching almost the target value. Those are the chemical parameters. There are also biological parameters. We use the so-called BBE, the Belgian Biotical Index, which is now changed to another index to be conform uh, with the Water Framework Directive. And we see it evolving from bad in the 1990s to good and on average, on average in uh, 2020. Uh, there is still room for improvement because the maximum score is very good and we have not reached that yet. Are the objective, objectives achieved? Well, uh, Flanders has achieved the targets of the Wastewater Treatment Directive. Uh, the Wastewater Treatment Directive was uh, absolutely a, a critical factor in the progress that we have made. But can we say that the water quality is uh, okay everywhere? No, we can't. Uh, the targets of the Framewater Directive are not achieved at this moment and new challenges continuously emerge. The Wastewater Treatment Directive was and is very relevant, but uh, in, in our opinion it needs an update in balance with the targets of the Water Framework Directive to challenge the future challenges. And I'll dive into those future challenges in the next slide. Uh, the first is the sanitation of the smaller agglomeration and of the areas outside of the agglomerations. As stated by Nele, uh, at, uh, currently there is no focus on those, uh, uh, on those agglomerations and they are still a major uh, challenge. In Flanders, we have uh, a, an extra obstacle and that is the rhythm development, which makes sanitations of these regions uh, quite difficult. So um, we need, uh, an opinion of Flanders is that we need clear targets uh, as well as for collective as for individual uh, systems in those uh, smaller agglomerations and in the areas outside the agglomerations. Uh, to help ourselves, we have made uh, the so-called zoning plans, which can uh, help us to tackle this uh, problem. Uh, second uh, major challenge are the CSO for the combined sewer overflows or the storm overflows. There are uh, several terms in the running. Uh, at the moment, the wastewater treatment directive has no actual requirements and they can have a substantial effect on water quality. So within the Flemish Environment Agency, uh, we are all, uh, for the moment almost 15 years. We have uh, uh, measurements of uh, around three to 400 uh, 
uh, CSOs to have an, uh, an idea about their impact on the water quality. Uh, and another uh, future challenge are the micro pollutants, the emerging pollutants, uh, being the microplastics, pharmaceuticals, um, the fluorine uh, compounds, for example, degradation products, and so on and so on. The wastewater treatment directive does not address this challenge, but this can have uh, serious effects uh, as well ecological as uh, on health uh, of uh, on human health. So this needs to be addressed. Uh, there is also the increasing uh, of the performance of the infrastructure. Uh, the treatment of wastewater is a continuous task. Uh, malfunctions in the system need to be addressed immediately. So the, the concept of business continuity is very important. There are also the requirements of the wastewater treatment plants that are sometimes, and uh, especially in regard to concentration values, are outdated and need to be updated, uh, aligned with the uh, water course objectives and also the state of the technology. And uh, last but not least, there is the attention for the ecological footprint greenhouse gases and the life cycle analysis and so on and so on of the wastewater uh, treatment operation because uh, as uh, stated uh, earlier it uh, it takes a lot of uh, a lot of energy and a lot of resources uh, resources brings me to the final challenge and that is the recuperation uh, circular economy uh, there is a lot of uh, water that is produced the effluents they can be used, uh, certain in regards to the problem, problems of the climate change, for appropriate purposes, not for all purposes. Uh, also, with regard to the needs of the water course, there is also the problem of energy uh, production, and uh, um, for example, fermentation and new technologies which can produce energy from wastewater, but also the saving of energy. Uh, and uh, uh, as uh, last, uh, the recuperation of materials, where phosphorus recuperation is uh, a very major issue at the moment. Uh, why do these uh, challenges need to be tackled on a European level? Every member state uh, is quite capable of coping with uh, some of those uh, issues themselves, but uh, we think that uh, a level playing field within Europe is needed and water knows no boundaries. So uh, the policy of uh, one country uh, may not have uh, uh, negative uh, effects on uh, neighboring countries. So if I uh, conclude, uh, summarize everything I've said, uh, the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive helped to raise the awareness uh, to the stick and carrot, and we've also uh, we've also met the stick in this process. Uh, it uh, set a sense of urgency. It led to a very substantial catching up operation in Flanders, which in its turn has led to improvement uh, of water quality, very visible at the moment. But it needs to be updated. The small agglomerations and the areas outside the agglomeration need some attention. Also, the combined sewer overflows, the emerging pollutants uh, needs to be need to be addressed, and also uh, attention to increase the performance of the infrastructure. And uh, uh, at last, uh, the recuperation of water materials and energy is also in, uh, very important. Uh, everything in harmony, and that is very important for us with the Water Framework Directive. Okay, thank you very much. That was uh, my contribution. Thank you very much, Stephen, for your interesting presentation. Um, if some of the attendees have questions, um, they can still ask them to the control panel. And I will now go on to the next speaker and I will give the floor to Cornel Rabai, um, professor from uh, University Gantz. Good um, afternoon. Can you uh, see my screen and hear me? Yes, we can see your screen. All right, full screen. Okay, wonderful. 
So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, it's really a, a pleasure to be here. Um, and I want to take a, a couple of minutes that I have to talk really from a technology standpoint about where I think um, the water sector should be in 2050. And then in the end, I want to br very briefly um, connect this a little bit with future frameworks. Uh, my affiliations, by the way, are Ghent University and Capture. All right. So if you think at this moment about wastewater treatment, we have been very successful, of course, in the in the past decades in increasingly in implementing uh, treatment systems. And if we think of these systems, in most cases, we think about large centralized approaches. The same goes for drinking water production. Increasingly, you see large scale systems also including membrane units, in this case, for desalination. Now, a key issue that you have with these technology routes is that they take a very long time to implement. Um, here you see a graph that on the x-axis gives you a, an idea of how mature a technology is, and on the y-axis how, uh, how many of these installations are built. And what this graph teaches us is that often it takes 30 to 40 years for new, new technologies and interventions to really become mainstream. And that has to do, of course, with the fact that we build very large installations that require a lot of planning and that require also a lot of risk mitigation. And so the result also of these large installations is that we have to build very extensive grids. And you can make the comparison with the electricity grid. So if I look at the data that's available to me in Flanders alone, there would be a value of some 50 billion euro already underground in concrete for sewers with an annual cost for maintenance of 200 million euro, will, which will certainly increase due to the network be get, getting older in the future and potentially somewhat higher temperatures and thus more corrosion. Similarly, we have a drinking water network. I'm not going to talk about losses uh, around that. I think our, our utilities are really doing their best to um, get as good as drinking water network as possible. But if just the data taken from one of the largest, well, the largest utility, they have over 30,000 kilometers of uh, lines already underground with a cost that can vary very much with size, of course, but can be around a quarter of a million per kilometer. So in a, a juxtaposition um, with these large infrastructures, um, you see more and more new technologies coming on board. Source separation of urine, treatment of gray water, um, treatment of black water, decentralized drinking water production. Um, you see an uh, arrow under the sink arrow from India even. So you have much smaller technologies coming on the market that are increasingly uh, capable for a district and even building and house level, perform the treatment that is now done at uh, centralized treatment plants. And actually, this can be quite impactful. Here, it's a bit of a boring slide, perhaps, from a style perspective, but let's go through some numbers. If you look at gray water treatment and our own models that we make in Ghent, uh, confirm that um, the 50% reduction in water consumption that's possible, that's claimed by some suppliers. Um, gray water treatments can also save heat because you don't need, you are reusing water that is at room temperature, for example, for washing purposes. So if you take a family of three, you could save 102 cubic meters per year at a current investment of 3,500 euro, which is the price for such an installation. You could say that if in the coming years we would first invest a, a billion, which we may now invest in sewers, but we install it instead in uh, such installations, we could make over a quarter of a million such installations at house and building level, which would save some 30 million almost cubic meters of drinking water. Similarly, you can look at black water treatment. The installations that I see, for example, the MET filter that I showed before, have a similar pricing level um, about a connection to a sewer, which can cost up to 16,000 euro for houses that are not in dense urban areas. And if you look at urine source separation, um, urine source separation is not about recovering nutrients. You do recover the nutrients, for example, the phosphorus at source, but it's more about removing the nutrients from the water purification. And a recent study also showed that there's up to 20% less sewer corrosion 
it has to do with less reduced conditions um, and you have up to 50 percent less energy consumption of water purification if you consider that uh, current uh, wastewater treatment sewage treatment consumes some 800 million kilowatt hours if you can pull a fraction of that by separating out the nutrients uh, that's considerable plus you increase capacity of treatment plants by up to about 20 percent by not loading with them with nutrients anymore so very important in the, all this technology development is not to directly compare centralized and decentralized technology. Decentralized technology is not just smaller technology, it's technology that has added benefits. It is not correct to compare a decentralized drinking water unit only in terms of energy consumption for drinking water production with a centralized unit. You have to take the whole story into account. There's also a huge advantage of decentralized technology, and that is innovation. Other sectors that are decentralizing are photovoltaics and mobile uh, consumer electronics. And so what you see in photovoltaics is a very rapid evolution of the price setting, meaning it becomes a lot cheaper because you mass produce small units and they have very fast beta and other versions. Um, the same is that through making smaller scale technology, you bring the product closer to the user, the user interacts more with it, and the mobile phone evolution is a very nice advantage of that. This is called consumer-driven innovation. So it's not unthinkable to, to change the concept in the coming years. If we think of this very important drive in society of electrification, um, we think about uh, powering mobility cars on houses. We should really consider electrification for treating water. If I would have to charge that car, I need 15 square meter of photovoltaic panels on a house. If I want to treat the water for a household, fully from uh, drinking water preparation to effluent treatment, you need about three to four square meters of photovoltaics on a house to supply that electricity. And then you can wonder, how you weigh off that electricity consumption relative to the overall investment of putting piped networks. Of course, this not, does not come for free. It is a transition. And in transition, you have challenges. Safety being one, you need to properly monitor smaller scale systems. But this can, is an important new role for utilities. I stress here that uh, many houses have in have high pressurized flammable gases arriving at the house level, have high voltage electricity arriving, and we have developed safe systems for that. Uh, there's actually an advantage of decentralized systems that if there is a failure of a system, that the impact is far more limited. The second one is economics. We have to see where the driver is. The concept of water of a service is critical because the incentive of uh, saving on water can actually be put with the utility. Why would the utility not invest in the grey water treatment system if by that for the same income from the consumer, they only have to deliver half the drinking water or can limit the piping? Similarly, this also goes for the connection with wastewater treatment. A wastewater utility could decide on installing decentralized technologies in order to not have to treat downstream. Of course, a challenge is that it's a transition. You are not going to um, get rid of all the large systems. It is clearly an and story and not an or. So to end up uh, in my um, hopefully not too rushed presentation, some take homes. Um, it's clear now from seeing the, the global evolution as well that decentralized technology can really add the innovation and sustainability to the water sector that we need. Tonight, today it's fighting, and I'm putting it on today's perspective a bit, the ever given. Uh, a very large existing uh, approach uh, that is ongoing, but um, I think that more and more scientists are convinced that the current approach with the centralized network is not necessarily the best approach. Second, the local robustness needs to be a key aspect. We need to locally capture water, use it, purify it, and put it back into nature. So the kilometers that are drinking water and wastewater are traveling is a key parameter to take into account how we are impacting our natural environment. And third, we really need to focus on new business models such as water for service that connect the cost with the benefit. If today 
I source separate urine to put it in perspective. This may save for a wastewater treatment plant operator, but for a, co for a consumer perspective, this would not make a difference. My contacts are here. I'm assuming that all these slides are presented uh, and are shared with uh, the different attendees. And I look forward to your comments to my uh, somewhat pro provocative, perhaps, uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for that interesting presentation. We will now go on to the next speaker, uh, Marjolein Wiemers from Aquafin. Thank you, Celeste. I will try to show my screen. We can, can see, you see my slides. Okay, thank you. Um, so I am Marjolein Wemers. I work for, for Aquafin, which is a company, a utility that is responsible for the infrastructure to deal with urban wastewater in Flanders. And in this presentation, I would like to give you an overview of how we think that urban wastewater treatment should be handled within 30 years from now and how the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive can help to establish that. It is quite clear, I think, that urban wastewater treatment and uh, the utilities that are active in this area are dealing with a lot of challenges. They have been mentioned before, so the stormwater overflows that place significant pressures on our water bodies. And uh, with more heavy rainfall events expected in the future, they will be an increasingly important source of pollution. Small agglomerations still place significant pressures on water bodies. How are we going to handle them? Knowing that connection to a centralized system is often not the most cost-effective solution. And furthermore, we have to deal with new compounds, microplastics, pharmaceuticals. Uh, these are not addressed in the current wastewater treatment directive, just like the pollutants that are carried by urban runoff. And uh, last but not least, the wastewater sector could definitely do more to help to meet the EU-wide climate and energy targets. So notwithstanding the fact that we have effectively implemented the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive, we definitely have quite some challenges ahead. The way that we look at these challenges is from uh, looking at them from a system point of view. So we advocate system-based solutions, system-based solutions that offer us a climate-proof urban wastewater treatment system by using green infrastructure in blue-green cities, uh, using nature-based solutions, source control measures, um, possibilities and opportunities for closing cycles, and a system in which we can link water to food and uh, water to energy. But, and that is very important, without compromising the performance of our treatment systems as we know them today, so without increasing loads of, for instance, nutrients to the environment. So how can we put this in practice? How can Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive contribute to that? Well, first of all, we are in favor of a flexible framework, a framework that allows us to think out of the box and that allows innovation instead of focusing on fixed targets for these new challenges. Take, for instance, the combined sewer overflows as an example. Um, in dealing with combined sewer overflows, the characteristics of the receiving water bodies must be taken into account uh, to make sure that these discharges do not have undesirable impacts. And therefore, it is not sufficient to just study the overflow performance and its impact at the local level. We should also take into account the whole wastewater system and the stormwater system, so the sewers, wastewater treatment plants, and also the receiving waters. And only then you can come to integrated solutions. And I would like to refer with that to the Interreg project impact that we just have uh, recently finished, and in which we used integrated modeling to define a program of cost-effective measures for, in this case, the river basin of the Dommel. Of course, a lot of monitoring is needed for such an approach, and these monitoring requirements could, for instance, be part of a revised urban wastewater treatment directive. Extensive monitoring and uh, IoT sensors can also allow for innovative real-time control algorithms, which we believe is a very efficient means to reduce overflow spillings and to optimize the water system in general. When it comes to micropollutants, it is important to realize that increasing the performance of the centralized system is not always the best solution to reduce the loads in the receiving water body. Solutions should combine centralized treatment on the one hand 
uh, with decentralized solutions and catchment scale modeling can help to find the best combination of cost and energy effective solutions. After all, removal of pharmaceuticals comes with a cost and the current standard technologies are very energy intensive. So research and development should focus on the development of more energy sufficient, uh, efficient solutions and developments and also developments that take into account the circularity of the materials that are used. Um, it brings me to a last point, the point of energy. Um, uh, the energy consumption of waste for the treatment plants and of course we support the idea that uh, energy consumption should be lowered at the waste for the treatment plants and that the treatment plants should be more self-sustaining but in addition to that there should also be sufficient attention for the greenhouse gas emissions all greenhouse gas emissions uh, which are related to the direct emissions of, for instance methane and nitrous oxides they should be evaluated together and taken into account also when evaluating new technologies of, or for instance, removal technologies for micro pollutants. Also here, uh, monitoring should be in place to support the development of innovative solutions. Um, another challenge that I did not mention before is the aging infrastructure that we have to deal with. And in fact, I would uh, not so much call it a challenge, it is actually a uh, uh, I'd rather say actually that it's an opportunity uh, because in the figure below that you see here, you see the investments in million euros that we need to replace or to renovate our infrastructure in the coming years. And the question is, of course, should we replace this infrastructure one on one or are we aiming for higher ambitions and do we grab the opportunity to rethink the whole system and to apply new concepts? new concepts in which we can combine water and nutrient recovery with energy production, with net zero emissions technologies. Uh, and these kind of concepts are already applied nowadays in uh, several demonstration projects. And I think that Cornel has also given some very nice examples of new concepts. So a lot of research efforts are going on to further develop these schemes and uh, they will definitely be applied on a more regular basis in the coming decades. Another example of rethink our infrastructure is the example of our um, sludge incinerator that is now in the design phase. We are building it and we hope to start it up at uh, 2026. And here we have decided to go for newest technology designed to deliver energy to the industry nearby and to create an opportunity to recover over 90% of the phosphorus that is captured within the sludge. Also here, we aim for systemic approaches. Um, take for instance, our nitrogen removal technologies. They are very performant when it comes to removing nitrogen from wastewater, but they are also known to emit nitrous oxide, which is a potent greenhouse gas. New concepts can recover nitrogen instead of removing it and without the emission of this nitrous oxide. And at the same time, they replace nitrogen fertilizers, the traditional nitro nitrogen fertilizers that are known to have a very energy intensive production process. Of course, all the new concepts that we are now talking about, again, should have at least equal or better performance compared to what we know nowadays in the traditional concepts, especially when it comes to nutrient removal. Um, finally, um, a third and uh, last tendency that we see when it comes to urban wastewater and the urban wastewater system of the future is that there is no one solution fits all. In the past, uh, we used standardized technologies and concepts and uh, our programs were directed top down by means of investment plans. And we are now shifting to a more bottom up approach because we are facing much more complex situations and we need to start to look for local enthusiasm, local stakeholders, compose a coalition of the willing and benefit from the local synergies in the field. So in that respect, it is important to be able to involve local stakeholders and look for local synergies. For example, uh, with respect to the design of the public domain, where blue-green solutions uh, offer opportunities, not only for handling stormwater on the one hand, but also for, for instance, recreation. And that's not just the case for uh, the urban environment. Also, this applies for industrial sites where you can exchange energy, nutrients, water sources from the urban water system um, with uh, industries nearby, and that can prove to be very successful. And in that sense, you can also start to think about new business models to finance such investments. 
Whether or not such a treatment or such a process is a success heavily depends on the local opportunities. So this uh, actually endorses the title of this slide, uh, local customization fits all, and uh, that's uh, according to us the way to go. In order to enable such an approach, we are in favor of reduction goals in a new directive instead of fixed performance targets for the extra efforts on top of what the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive imposes nowadays. So that was actually my uh, third and last statement. And in this last slide uh, is summarized what uh, we think should be addressed by a revised urban waste for the treatment directive. It should be a framework that allows us to think outside of the box and that allows flexibility for innovation. It should also allow infrastructure rethinking in order to gradually transform our in infrastructure and our traditional waste for the treatment to new treatment and recovery schemes. And finally, we are in favor of local customization, taking into account the local context involving the local stakeholders to define the best and the most efficient cost-effective solutions in the field. So with that, I uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marie-Hélène, for your interesting presentation. Um, I would now like to give the floor to our next speaker, Stijn van Herk from the city of Leuven. Hello. I see your presentation. You can see the presentation. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Stijn van Herk, an engineer of the city of Leuven, my hometown. I'm part of a team of specialists that design, maintain, and guard the effectiveness of the public domain of the city of Leuven. This includes the city sewers, since Leuven lists among the minority of Belgian cities that still owns and maintains its own sewer network, not only bringing the wastewater from the private homes to the aquafin collectors, but also managing the rainwater. Leuven is a city with more than 105,000 inhabitants located about 25 kilometers east of Brussels. It's home to the KU Leuven, Belgium's largest university, and if you combine the inhabitants with the students and the visitors, our population counts around 200,000 during the academic year. Last year, Leuven was awarded the title European Capital, Capital of Innovation. This was due to its strong collaboration with its inhabitants, its institutes of knowledge, and its organizations and industries. One of the prime players in that view is the non-profit organization Leuven 2030, which started up to help the city prepare for 2030, but ended up writing a roadmap to 2050. In this, I participated as an expert advisor. Why me? Uh, besides the aforementioned credentials, I'm also regularly attached uh, to a number of councils and think tanks concerning the problems that face us, the problems that will face us, and how to face them. But most of all, I was willing. Uh, the rest of my talk will inform you not only of our hopes and dreams for the future, uh, based on what you already know, but also uh, enlighten you, hopefully, to some of the facts and the restrictions you might not be as aware of or might underestimate. Uh, I'll stay clear of some topics because I like the experience, and I'll skip over the given. Uh, a mixture 2050 will be a mixture of dream sci-fi and reality a, a durable solution that leads to a sustainable city can only be reached if we approach the problems and solutions from different angles and choose those solutions that are not mono but multifunctional. therefore i will present you a few viewpoints from the viewpoint of mobility planning and public domain 30 years from now we hope to we hope for self-driving eco-friendly cars that are shared in use and combined with public transport thereby reducing not only the carbon footprint but also the parking space footprint cars that park and recharge out of sight underground self-driving hence law-abiding reducing thereby the footprint of visual and physical traffic aid. From the viewpoint of ecologically, ecology, planning and public domain, 30 years from now we hope for historical city centers surrounded by biodiverse food producing greenery blended with equal rights housing projects that share areas com of common needs, of clean waterways teeming with biodiverse fauna and flora that crisscross the city centers and suburbs with wide green clean riverbanks thereby bringing coolness into the city. 
from the viewpoint of waste management and public domain 30 years from now, we hope for a society in which every item gets a second, third, fourth, and so on life. And all broken items are repaired or recycled. Even wastewater will be partially processed on site. It will be harvested for its inherent warmth and mined for its valuable components, such as, such as chemicals, organic matter as fertilizer or biofuel, and water itself. And wastewater will be a resource rather than a problem. I could go on, but I've only got a limited amount of time, so I'll cup it up for you. Most city engineers dream of a sewage system with following characteristics. The rainwater management starts on private property, which e with each property maximizing its cap captation in terms of reuse and infiltration. In the public domain technology, the modal shift and urban planning will free up space for nature-based solutions for rainwater management uh, for heat island countermeasurements and to provide other ecosystem services. Wastewater will be totally separated from the rainwater and open water systems and will have a resource status. It will be mined locally, thereby reducing the need for sewer systems. We count on te technology, not only to optimize our systems and collect the necessary data for us to upgrade our game, but also to monitor, to monitor, correct, and optimize existing systems. Since it's a dream, money is no problem, because this system will be self-sustaining and the necessary funds will be allocated to make the installation possible for all classes. All these decisions have a few thing in common, things in common. They strive towards an equilibrium between nature and the needs of humanity. They need humanity to place the common good before their own personal interests, and they are based on the assumption that the necessary space and money can be found for us to do what is needed. But most of all, they are impossible to realize within 30 years in the current social, political, and economic structures. Because 2050, at first glance, 30 years from now, might seem a rather distant future. But it is far closer than you might think when infrastructure is involved. On average, an above ground city infrastructure gets a total makeover once every 45 years. At that moment, the sewers will be analyzed and repaired if needed, but most of the time they will expect it to be expected to last for another term. Hence, it will not surprise you, <coughs> surprise you that quite a few of our sewers predate the Second World War, some even the first. On average, only one major traffic artery can be under construction at the same time, so as not to block the access to, from, and inside the city. On average, remodeling a street and its sewer costs around 1 million euros, while the city of Leuven has 1,069 streets. Doing it right means measuring and researching the terrain, its underground, the adjoining building, buildings, and their sewers. Combining sewer and surface works, customization, because as was said before, new two, no two locations are the same, collaborating with the utilities, adapting to new views, quick win experiments and learning from each other's mistakes, adding nature-based solutions and finding synergy with non-engineering fields such as well-being, social bonding and ecosystem services, keeping up with research and technology. As engineers, we understand the necessity of deadlines, but it's a thin line between motivational and demotivational deadlines. Because there are limits, limits in the current social, political, and economic structure. There are a lot of factors that slow us down. For instance, ground. Without a ground, it takes six to eight years between deciding that the street needs a new sewage system and the completion of the project. With a ground, all bets are off. Our longest running project has been running for over 23 years. The ground requirements and administration slow the whole process down and cost a lot of money to the receiver and the grantor. <coughs> contractors, it, take on, it takes on average a few seconds to ask a known and trusted contractor if he is interested and capable to take on a job at his usual fair rate. It takes them a few hours to check if it fits in their schedule but that's not allowed. Instead, I need to waste hours of my time trying to write a flawless public tender. 
I need to put it on an open market filled with specialized and lawyer adopt scoundrels who will use the law and each small oversight in the tender against me and against the fair contractors. The contractors need to read my tender and write their own com to compete. A system well, designed to open up markets and stomp out corruption has created a market in which a few terms specialized firms specialized in tenders dominate. Time and money are wasted to end up with a project, product of lesser quality at a higher cost. Because firms that specialize in tenders care less about collaboration and quality than firms that need reliable references. Participation. Today we have reached a time in which it's possible to make the general public understand why certain actions are needed. So we should act. Instead, the process is slowed down to allow for participation. To put this into context, we presented our design to a neighborhood 500 invitations a few weeks ago. On average, of those who bothered to check the plans for their streets, about half of them, bothered to comment, about 25%. And four in five of those that commented, commented liked the new plans, but disliked the area in front of their property. No comments resulted in a major design change, which means about two months in time were lost and about 100 working hours were spent on an action that resulted in almost no changes. And then there are the factors that limit us. There is monitoring and governance. All rules need systems to check if people follow the rules to enforce them. This is still lacking because at the moment it would cost too many man hours. Privacy. We look to the digital world to find solutions to reduce the man hours needed for monitoring and governance but are limited by privacy laws. Terms of office. Money spent on sewers is money buried. Politicians have a limited amount of time and budget when in power. And from a politician's point of view, it's logical to invest in something visible, something that will secure them votes in the next election. Fields of study. Humans have divided the world into nicely bordered fields of study, but in reality, almost all fields are correlated. Very few of the fields of knowledge necessary for nature-based solutions with ecosystem services are part of an engineer's education. In other words, to build the wastewater management of the future, we'll need to educate and re-educate the specialists first. We'll need to do it fast, not so that they, have, that they have all the knowledge themselves, but just enough of it to realize that, that when they, we need advice from others and who from. Privatization. As mentioned before, quite a few cities have privatized their wastewater management to specialized firms. Specialization in a field of study means not necessarily looking towards sustainable integrated solutions. It also means another partner at the negotiation table to slow us down. Ownership and business models. Science and technology are evolving to turn wastewater into a resource to be mined. This will lead to business models and to questions about ownership. Who will be allowed to mine it? If it's my waste, am I not entitled to the profits gained from it? Conclusion. As guardians of the public domain on our journey to a durable and sustainable city, we city engineers have our eyes locked upon the destination, but we have accepted that its outlook will change as things progress because new knowledge and opportunities will arise. We're prepared to learn and adjust to the changes of the scenery. We have armed ourselves against the inevitable struggle with the restraints put upon us by the current social, political, and economic climate. We have anticipated the hurdles that bureaucracy and logistics will put in our way, and we trust upon you to help loosen some of these restraints and break down some of these hurdles, because our best chance of success lies in cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stan, for your presentation. Then we can now go on to the panel discussion. Um, so you can still ask your questions uh, through the control panel. Then we will include them in the panel discussion. Um, Bernard Potter from CEWE will join us for that. And Jan Vrieke from Minarat will be the moderator from now on. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> Do you hear me? I suppose so. 
I do. Uh, perfect. Well, I just want to check if every participant is here. So the speakers are still here. Is Bernard here too? Yes, Bernard yes. is here too. Very well. Uh, then I want to welcome you all and uh, first to say something general and then I'll give the floor to you. Um, my name is Jan Verheke. I'm director of the MINARAD, the Flemish Environmental Council, Advisory Council. Every six months we cooperate with the VLEVA and have a general overview of European environmental uh, policy. But this session is an extra session on the UWWDTD, the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. And as we heard um, from Ms. Rosenstock, this UWWTD has been very fit for purpose in the past uh, three decennia, but it is not fit or not yet fit or not totally fit for purpose in the perspective of 2050. There are a lot of challenges that remain. So I'll ask first a question to uh, Bernard de Potter, the chairman of the Coordination Commission of Integrated Water Policy in Flanders, as you just joined the debate as a chairman, uh, it's ultimately your job to match and manage all the expectations of the different actors. What do you think? Do you think that this um, afternoon has been helpful? Have you got, uh, have you got a good overview of the issues? Can you name one issue that you heard that everybody agrees upon? Or do you think that something is missing? Uh, thank you, Jan. Um, yeah, thank you for uh, giving me so also the floor here. Um, yeah, it was been uh, a time journey. Uh, yes, we have been in 2050, even uh, more longer. Um, maybe it's good to say also where we are debating in the Coordination Commission today, uh, because uh, yes, at this moment, and it's an important moment since uh, we are debating on uh, the uh, preview of the third um, river management plans, uh, um, plans, where also included, of course, is uh, the uh, issue of uh, the uh, waste water treatment uh, with uh, the zoning plans uh, included in this uh, river management uh, plan. And indeed, there are a lot of challenges uh, before us, as already mentioned in the debate. Uh, there are uh, the small agglomerations and the areas uh, outside these agglomerations. Uh, we have already seen that uh, we have uh, made a lot of progress the last 30 years uh, with uh, persons of more than 85% uh, of wastewater uh, treated so far, but there is still a challenge of 15%. And uh, due to economics, you know, and the first percents are uh, much easy to uh, purify than the last, uh, last 15 percent. So also due to uh, the scattered housing, uh, it's still a very, uh, yeah, uh, on technological uh, issue, but also on an economical issue, what we will do uh, with that. Within uh, the Coordination Commission, uh, we will uh, spend a special meeting on that in uh, in April, on the 23rd of April. Uh, this is on a, on a special meeting, how we will tackle uh, this uh, challenge for uh, the future. Um, it is also, I think, uh, very important to say that uh, recovery of energy and materials is also a, a very challenging topic. Net at this moment, in parallel of this uh, seminar, there is the first meeting of uh, the uh, team group on water within uh, Flanders circular circularity. So within the governance, you know, in, in Flanders, there is Vlaanderen circular, uh, um, Flanders circular. This has uh, several teams. One of this team is water. It's uh, this afternoon, the first meeting of the working group, uh, which will treat also the debate on uh, recovery of materials and energy. I think this one will, one, will be one of the uh, issues there. Uh, you know, there's also on the European level, uh, level there is uh, the uh, European Rio, uh, reuse um, 
uh, directive. It's not a directive. Um, uh, it's also legal regulation. regulation, yeah, which we has to set up, set into practice also in Flanders. Uh, this regulation was a narrow scope reuse of uh, wastewater treatment and agriculture uh, uh, applications. We want to set up a framework in Flanders which uh, will be bro more broader. So uh, this is also uh, an important topic. And a third one, of course, are the emerging pollutants. Uh, yeah, uh, we have, for example, seen also uh, due now to COVID, uh, where we have uh, also measurements of uh, the uh, virus in wastewater treatments, but also uh, yeah, the use of uh, medicaments and so on. And we have seen the hotspot of Hasselt, for example, in this uh, uh, issue. So that will also be uh, a very important topic, which uh, will has to be treated uh, within uh, the next uh, decades. So okay. indeed, we have already achieved a lot of uh, issues and we have to uh, still uh, debate on a lot of uh, things within the Coordination Commission. We are already uh, using this. There is happening something. I think I'm out of uh, scope. No, now. you're okay. You're okay. Okay, uh, I don't see anything anymore on my screen. <laughs> uh, so uh, we are debating this uh, within uh, projects and also into uh, platforms. Uh, it was also uh, very striking of uh, the um, city planner of Leuven, which uh, mentioned. Which yes, then which mentioned a lot of uh, bureaucratic hurdles, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that's also, of course, a very important issue due, due to the very uh, yeah, long-term period between a decision on an investment and a real investment uh, on the on the floor. So I think there is also a lot of uh, work to do on that side. Thank you very much, Bernard. Um, I want to come to that point on concrete motivational and non-motivational uh, procedures of Stein at the end. But as you mentioned it, I immediately pass the ball to Stein. Stein, um, do you have been giving a very compelling explanation about the uh, administrative uh, hurdles that we all need to take, and especially the local uh, uh, um, government needs to take in order to solve problems. Do you think that this revision of the uh, directive or, or this potential revision of the directives offer a chance for improvements? Uh, I, I really hope so. Uh, I think that uh, every revision should offer a potential of improvements. Uh, and I uh, understand, of course, that quite a, f a few of the things I mentioned are outside of the scope of the 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 paper and the revision and the that we are talking about now but i think it needs to be taken into account because if we want uh because i think it's really necessary that we move fast uh and if we want to move fast we we need to get some of these hurdles and those restraints out of the way uh or at least uh reduce their impact i okay. i understand that most of them are uh, were created out of a necessity uh, or at least a perceived necessity and that none of them were created uh, just to annoy us. Uh, I'm, I'm quite aware of that, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a general principle that we have a tendency to create a lot of rules because of a few wrongdoers instead of uh, reprimanding the wrongdoers themselves. And Thank I, you. Uh, that's uh, that's a, a general uh, um, uh, point problem. of view on this thing, uh, on on this thing, and and uh, maybe we could uh, try to have a more concrete um, vision on this specific topic. Cornel, in your point of view, with your solutions or your way of solutions, uh, do you think that you offer an improvement on administrative procedure, or would it get things more intricate? Of course, you will say the first, but why? Um, well, I fully agree on the point that, that we need to decrease administrative hurdles. Eh? There was this nice article in the Standard, I believe, earlier this week on an architect, Snodzi, 
and he has the rule of Snodzi, and he decreased the amount of building rules in a village from 250 down to 7 plus 1. And the eighth rule was that if the project would get better by violating one of the rules, by all means do so. So um, you, you need to have some flexibility in the systems. Um, can it make things better from an administrative perspective? Um, I, I think so, because uh, certainly implementation of technology within a building um, can uh, improve, um, can be, well, one can install in a building more or less what you want, as long as at the outflow of the building you are in line with what can happen. Um, there is an administrative complexity on, on decentralized systems, and that's how to link um, whoever is, is um, investing uh, in that case in uh, dealing with pollution um, and who is benefiting from it. If you see it now, people are out of voluntarism installing systems uh, because they want to contribute. It's like solar panels. People would invest in solar panels, uh, even though it was not economic at all, but they wanted to contribute. And, okay. and then uh, we learned in this transition that with solar panels, I, I can say we had a few hiccups in the transition. And so mm -hmm. for water, we have to think very well. If others will contribute to the purification of water, how shall we deal with this? And this is a bit where I, I think this water for service model can help if a drinking water utility, a wastewater utility gets more flexibility in how they want to achieve certain targets. Um, from my end, it could be more interesting for a local drinking water utility to install grey water treatment units at buildings and thereby deliver only half the water. Okay. And how you sort that out, that, that's important. How you, how, if someone installs in a building technology that leads to less discharge, at this moment, you, as a large polluter, you pay for nitrogen, phosphor, COD discharge because you have a measurement campaign. If you're a smaller user, you cannot do that. So how do you reward people who are um, installing new technologies without saying, you know, you have to do an 800 euros per year or what it costs, measurement combined under COD and nitrogen and phosphorus and all the rest. Mm -hmm. That we need to make a framework for to say that you install this um, black water treatment, fine, you get a benefit. Okay. And, and not discuss it too much. <clears throat> There will be a lot of discussion, I, I suspect. But uh, <laughs> Marjolein, uh, you um, stated that you, uh, with uh, Aquafin, will be thinking out of the box as a central uh, uh, statement that you are uh, that the challenges for infrastructure are an opportunity to rethink the system, and that local customization will fit all. And um, well, uh, also the other two speakers have been thinking out of the box. What do you think? Have they been thinking analogous things as yours, or have they have they been thinking different things than yours? Is, do you see a, a form of analogy, or do you see differences? Your microphone is not on. It should be okay now. Do you hear yeah. me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I definitely think that um, in the end we all have the same message. Uh, I heard that uh, Cornel also said that it is not an or question, but it is an end question. And I think I fully agree to that. And you should look at the, the, the best combination of solutions. And that is also thinking out of the box, or also literally out of the box of the urban wastewater system. And then I uh, refer to Spain, I think, uh, the possibility to, or the opportunity to create multiple benefits um, and to look for synergies. Um, that's also what we mean by thinking outside of the box. So yes, I, uh, I think that in the end, we all have the same message. You should look for mm -hmm. the best combination um, in the local context. Okay, thank you, uh, Marilene. If you all have the same message, then we could close the debate. Um, <laughs> do the others agree on this? And then I'll turn back to Bernard. But first, Stein and Cornel, do you agree that you basically have the same message and that only in details there is a difference? Uh, yeah, I, I think so, yes. That, that, uh, in general, we have the same message that uh, what we do now is the groundwork for uh, future generations and that it will take a lot of time 
so that every step that we take needs to be uh, thought of carefully and needs to co uh, uh, coordinate and integrate uh, a lot of things because we don't want uh, too many new problems to arise due to our current solutions. So I think that we agree, yeah. Okay, thank you. Cornel, you started by saying you would be provocative, but in the end you have the same message as the others. So try again. Disappointing, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm happy that it is uh, um, not considered provocative. Um, it, it will have some implications on how we think, of course, about uh, implementing. I think a provocative part is perhaps that I, I do dare question uh, some of the current large investment plans that exist because one of the things that is important if if you see that a transition is coming the countries typically who embrace a transition early on are the ones who in the end benefit most and I think in Flanders we have been missing a few transitions and then afterwards claimed like, well, we should have put better goals after all. Um, we should avoid that in the water sector. We see uh, on micro pollutants, new challenges coming. So um, let's think on where we are going to address these and how. Um, and let's there change tactics along the way as well. There is nothing wrong with progressing inside. So, it is clear from my perspective, I'm absolutely against any investments in sewers, for example, um, because um, they are a, a lock-in. And of course, you cannot always avoid it. It is an and story, uh, uh, not an or. But I think we should change our frame and first think, do we need a sewer or can we solve it with local new technologies? Um, and I think in many cases that will be provocative because it goes against running investment plans and it makes people obviously nervous because it's so difficult to negotiate budget from cities and intercommunales and governments to organize this budget. And then along come a few people and say, let's do it differently. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, um, but we have to dare do that and say, you know, if we learn, why don't we change our priorities and say first decentralized approaches and then centralized if if it makes more sense. I'll give the floor to Marjolaine because I see she wants to say something and then I go to Bernard. Marjolaine? <laughs> Um, I, I, I liked your last sentence, Conil, if it makes sense. Um, of course, I agree if it makes sense um, to whether it is about decentralized system or a centralized system, you just have to choose the system that makes the most sense. And um, in, I think that we do not really agree on whether or not a sewer is the most appropriate, but then this is a question of, I think, the figures and the facts and uh, comparing them, and maybe we should do that once in a, in a concrete uh, example. But um, I... Uh, I think I agree, you just have to choose for the system that makes the most sense and I also agree that a decentralized system and especially in the smaller agglomerations might make more sense than connecting to a central sewer system. Of course in Flanders we are densely populated and in city centers or close by uh, a sewer will, uh, will be the best solution, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Bernard, uh, I discern in this uh, discourse that we are having now a strong analogy with the evolution of the energy and electricity market in which originally everything was also centralized and centrally uh, organized and produced nuclear uh, uh, installations etc and then gradually and at last in the past few years uh, exponentially we've been working towards decentralized systems uh, with uh, indeed uh, uh, energy as a service, uh, connect costs with benefits, with prosumers, etc., etc. Um, and it is a discussion and a, tr and a transition which has lot. It, it is a transition which has caused a lot of discussion and regulatory uh, challenges. Uh, do you think that we, with the water sector, are evolving in the same direction? Um, or is this, a, is this at least a perspective that can be discussed? 
well, uh, everything can be discussed, but I don't see the, the same transition and because okay. there you have the privatization and I think uh, water is uh, another asset which uh, as for us uh, has more a public character. Uh, that doesn't mean that there is a discussion uh, between centralization and decentralization uh, in uh, the sewage um, yeah, infrastructure. But I think it is a more, uh, uh, more uh, important uh, question, of course. If you look, for example, into the uh, areas outside uh, agglomeration, you must first consider and the main drivers of the pressures of, for example, eutrophication. And maybe you need other measures uh, before you thinking about sewage systems. So uh, I think this is more an important question. If, if you look toward are the, from a, a, an economical and eco, ecological point of view, the most important measure or the first measures to take, um, you know that the drivers also, for example, uh, from um, diffuse pollutants and uh, agriculture and so on, are in some areas the most important driver. And uh, maybe if you look into a cost benefit uh, uh, measurements, uh, that makes it in a more uh, uh, broader framework. So that's first uh, 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 due to um, uh, centralization, uh, decentralization. Uh, another point is, of course, uh, we uh, till now we have looked to uh, sewage systems, but of course, due to drought. Uh, there is also the rainoff uh, of uh, uh, of rainwater, and uh, there is and due to also city development. Uh, I think uh, either the discussion uh, centralization, decentralization, how you will uh, plan an integrated uh, system where you combine the effects of uh, sanitation and uh, uh, flooding and drought together, and to much more a green. Uh, blue infrastructure within a city, city environment. And then in a third uh, uh, issue, you become to and what this makes it mo most sense. But I think, uh, of course, what makes it sense, we comes to the bus business development, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, business model. Uh, it's not and the uh, 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 a person or a firm which uh, makes the investment which will also gain uh, uh, in the uh, value cycle. And that's an important uh, uh, problem to tackle. So water as a service uh, that's uh, developing into practice uh, will uh, take, I think, a lot of discussions. And another uh, point of view, uh, we have seen that there are 50,000 kilometers of sewage systems already today. So we have already built a lot of infrastructure we cannot stop from one moment to another moment to say, yeah, we don't, disc uh, uh, we don't look that at this anymore. So there will be a lot of attention in asset management within at least the coming 20 years. So it's, uh, yeah, uh, renewing a house when you are uh, living in it, that's much more difficult than building a new house. I'm considering a lot of models here, which I also, uh, find it very interesting and I think within the water uh, scene in Flanders you see there is already an agreement here around the table so within the thinking circular models are already there but to implement it into practice as I already said we live already in a house and we have renew in the house when we are living in it that makes it very challenging uh, due to uh, then a last comment, uh, we have, for example, seen uh, now due to uh, the river management uh, plans, and that's a message to Europe, uh, the uh, framework directives are very pres pre prescriptive. For example, uh, the public consultation must uh, uh, have an, a duration of six months. Uh, so there's a lot of prescription from a European level. If you want to uh, experiment to have innovation into the workflow, I think the framework must set the goals, but less also some flexibility to tackle and to, uh, to transform the uh, framework directives into practice, but taking into account uh, the local context uh, of Flanders uh, uh, and, and, and the rural development, uh, for example, of Flanders.
Thank you very much for this very rich uh, reaction, Bernard. I will now pass the ball to all three of the uh, participants. Uh, and I also say that in the end, my last question will be to each of your four. What do you want? What do you wish that would be said in the public consultation about this directive? So be ready for this last question. That's not now, eh? but what do you wish that would be said in this consultation? But the, before the last question, I come back to issues that have been presented now. First to Corneel. Uh, the remark before the last remark of Bernard was about sunk costs. We have invested a lot in a certain type of infrastructure and uh, this infrastructure has a value. Uh, it needs reinvestment to keep it up at a quality level. So is this uh, compatible with your, with the central um, thought of your proposition? I, I think so. I mean, there's no one size fits all. Eh? You don't throw away the house because you want to change your water system. Um, implementation such as a grey water treatment unit, they at this moment they mainly decrease ask the request for water flows and they decrease the the water flux on the sewer, not necessarily the COD load. And these are starting points that are impacts as well. Um, but of course, if you have major investments to do, at that point you should just weigh uh, whether it's worthwhile to do these major investments or whether you can do this uh, via distributed investments. Um, I acknowledge the problem. Eh? If we build new districts and living areas in cities that do not connect to an existing sewer network, then, then uh, today the rest of society is paying for that sewer network. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there will be more and more issues like that. Um, but again, it's the same as the electricity grid. We are now in this transition where actually the majority of the cost is in transporting electricity and not producing it. And this is also an inherent threat to your evolution towards this distributed power uh, production. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn from these transitions, um, but we should not, to end uh, my statement, um, sunk cost is an interesting word. It brings us to the sunk cost effect, right? Which is human psychology to continue on a path that you're walking because you have been walking on that path for so long. And if we think of a FIRA train as an example, um, I think we should avoid around FIRA. Okay, okay. Good comment. Um, Marjolaine, um, I've been reading in your uh, magazine. Uh, uh, I, I read it every time it comes into my, into my box, of course, um, that uh, also Aquafin is striving for integrated solutions because Bernard raised the point, and I will ask the same to Stein. Integrated solutions in which droughts, um, uh, inundations uh, and water sewage treatment are considered are as three factors uh, which should be considered together when making plans and you are offering services in that respect can you comment upon this uh, yes uh, i think uh, it, it is indeed the way to go that we have to um, tackle all these challenges together because they are very closely interlinked they are all part of the water system and um, a sewer system can play an important role in this um, because we you are transporting water from one way for from one part to another uh, place uh, so you should grab the opportunity to find the best solution there and some examples that we can give is an, an um, for instance, an, an industrial zone where we have to um, uh, get the, the stormwater out of the sewer system and there is not too much place around there to, uh, to discharge it or to infiltrate it. So we are now looking together with the companies there to see whether they can reuse it. So then you have this win-win, this synergy and integrated solution in which you can solve different problems at the same time. Okay. So a problem of water security together with a, a challenge that we are facing to, to get rid of this, uh, this storm water. Uh, also on the public domain, I think you can find a lot of integrated solutions by using the sustainable urban drainage solution that, that can make sure that in your public domain you have nice areas for recreation and, and blue-green structures in your city that can uh, also upgrade the quality of living. And at the same time, they solve a problem when it comes to transport of stormwater to combine sewer overflows and you name it. So it's the kind of integrated solution. And the way we try to look at the water system, not only focusing on 
just this wastewater port, but out of the box and the total water system. Great, sounds great. Stain, integration and local com uh, government? Um, Mario Lan already said so. Huh? We, we have uh, a lot of areas where we are looking at reducing uh, the pavement and therefore creating uh, areas of greenery where we can uh, get the water to flow to the greenery, have a chance to uh, infiltrate into the underground uh, before it overflows uh, at a, uh, when uh, the rain falls too heavily uh, into an underground uh, sewer system that will lead it to another infiltration system and eventually to a river. Uh, so it's that kind of, of thing that integrates the the groundwater and the uh, rainwater management, thereby reducing the effect on uh, the wastewater management and reducing the risk of overflow uh, of wastewater into the rivers downstream, but also creating areas where we can plant trees uh, that give us shade, that uh, captivate the CO2 emissions, that, that cool down the city, that uh, uh, have a, a social bonding, system because you can put a bench underneath the tree and the, the, you get a, an integrated uh, uh, feel from the urban from the, the, the inhabitants of the neighborhood uh, we even uh, let them help uh, they can adopt these areas and plant their own choosing of plants okay. if they work together and that kind of a Go okay. Yeah, Thank you, Stan. You are in the same line of thinking. Now, a final round and very short because it's a bit over time. I give you a chance to be influencer. There are still some listeners, uh, some uh, uh, in in this in this meeting. So you can be influencer. What would you wish that would be said in the consultation round on this directive in the coming weeks and months? Cornel, what is your wish? What what should be the central tenet? of people um, bringing in their point of view? Well, for me, I would say that the urban and industrial environment has to minimize the amount of water it pulls out of the environment and pushes back. So if we strive for this local robustness, a city has a large wastewater treatment plant, great. Reuse the wastewater and produce drinking water from it and send it back to the city so its footprint lowers and distances of water transport minimize. So try okay. to close local loops at whatever level is most relevant, which is, I think, something we agree here on. Um, mm -hmm. That is key. OK. I have may do a small one. OK, uh, of course. Uh, look at other societal transitions like photovoltaics and mobile phones, how they dealt with innovation and implement these concepts of rapid prototyping Mm -hmm. rapid prototyping with living labs and the like in our society we need much faster innovation okay thank you Marjolein um, I, um, I would hope that um, this public consultation acknowledges the efforts that have been made already but that they also endorse the idea of having a flexible framework that allows for innovation so in that sense I uh, fully agree to what Cornel said flexible framework that can allow uh, innovation and that also enables us to align the ambitious uh, um, ambitions of an urban wastewater treatment directive with other ambitions like for instance circular economy or uh, carbon neutrality thank you very much Stan. well since Marjolaine and Cornel said uh, most of it already i will go for the uh, multifunctionality i think mm -hmm. that uh, we should uh, allow and look for solutions that are multifunctional uh, and that can be adapted uh, to the new technology that will be invented and is in progress of being invented to the new climate as well because uh, wish as we may that will probably still change a lot uh, by the time it's 2050. Okay and Bernard you are in a different position of course but have you final no. comment? I had first of all and the same points, but I want to add another one. And we know that uh, the uh, urban water uh, framework directive in the first was sanitation, health of the people. I think uh, nowadays and the focus must be uh, biodiversity and we must look at the end result, uh, having and uh, fresh waters, living waters, 
where we all uh, enjoy uh, living near. I think this is important. And this within the framework of climate change, climate adaptation. So also uh, flexibility uh, will be an, an important point because what we think will be the best measure today can be within 10 years already changed due to the ecological uh, okay. Uh, evolution. But biodiversity thing, I think this must be the first goal, also from the framework for the new uh, urban waste uh, treatment directive. Thank you very much. A very last and pertinent comment. We are, it was a very fruitful and interesting debate. I thank you all very much. It was five minutes longer than expected, but no uh, need because my final speech will five minutes be five, be five minutes shorter. So anyway, I, I give now the floor to, I think, uh, Celeste, or immediately to um, uh, Tom uh, of the cabinet. Uh, I don't know how we will give the floor to the other speaker. Celeste? Uh, so uh, now indeed it's the time for okay. Tom. I'm muted. I was muted, not anymore, so I hope everyone can hear me. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tom, Tom de Witt. Uh, I'm policy advisor to the Flemish Minister of uh, Environment, Zuhal de Mier, and more specific for all the water-related topics. Um, I will give a short overall uh, reflection on the presentations and uh, the debate we just had. So unfortunately for you all, that means that I don't have slides, but you will uh, need to look at me for the next 10, uh, 10 minutes. So I'm very sorry for that. Um, but first of all, I would like to thank the organization for setting up this uh, this interesting meeting concerning the uh, wastewater directive i believe we heard a, a lot of interesting speakers and uh, points of uh, of use today um, since the directive is 30 years old you could say that today we actually have the pleasure to attend a, a birthday party perhaps not the party we were all hoping for after one year of covid uh, but i believe that there are some reasons to um, to let's say celebrate um, and According to traditions on uh, on birthdays, you take some time to look uh, to look back, to look back in time to see where it all started, where we came from, what we achieved, and also what lays ahead of us. Uh, so immediately, immediately, uh, a lot of questions are raised uh, about the future, about a new uh, a new directive. Uh, luckily, we of course don't start from a blank page. Um, the directive, which is almost older than myself, has led to a significant better water quality in uh, in Flanders. As, uh, as Stephen mentioned earlier, the quality in Flanders was in the beginning of, uh, of the 1990s was, was bad and infrastructure was scarce. So the directive provided the framework to change this. Um, be not afraid, I'm, I'm not going to repeat everything uh, Stephen said, but I think it's clear that much has been achieved yet in terms of, of infrastructure, but also in terms of organization. Um, for instance, Aquafin, who, uh, who, saw, who, saw, yeah, who saw, saw the light, if I can say it like that. Uh, and obviously, in terms of, of, of water quality, the foundation of Aquafin, that was uh, the word I was searching for. Um, but obviously, so in terms of water quality, and I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that as a region, we all together uh, successfully implemented the principles and goals of the directive and we can be proud of uh, the results so far but of course the work is isn't isn't done yet um and although the directive was important in the process and it's clear um that we made some success or we had some success i think an update is uh, is needed so we welcome uh, the process that the commission has set up to update the wastewater directive and I know it's a, it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but um, water knows no boundaries. So Flanders is also looking towards Europe to set an, uh, a level playing field and to ensure a, a good coherence between the updated directive and the water framework directive. So the principles that um, Ms. Rosenstock mentioned in her presentation earlier on are, are definitely a, a good cause. Um, I also welcome the, the input several stakeholders have given today. Um, I will not try to, to summarize everything, um, but I will share some, some, some observations and, and some of my thoughts uh, with you that seem relevant to me uh, in this phase of, uh, of the discussion. Um, first, uh, it seems clear that the revision of the directive should 
aim high, aim high when it comes to contributing to the circular economy. Moving towards the circular economy is a priority in uh, the Flemish environmental policy and the review of the directive should allow us to seize the opportunities that are emerging in this uh, in this field. So lots of opportunities, as also mentioned by, uh, by Professor Rabai. Um, our minister has taken the lead in uh, developing the Blue Deal, uh, which is an, in, uh, an investment program to tackle water scarcity and drought um, as part of the European Recovery and uh, Resilience Plan. So closing the water circles, valuing water actually, is an important part of the Blue Deal, meaning that treated wastewater is uh, an important source of water we are looking at. Circularity in terms of water is indeed important to Flanders, um, as also explained more in detail by, uh, by Bernard de Potter or by, uh, by Marjolaine. Um, besides the water circle itself, we need, to, we need steps or we need to make steps to, to close material cycles as well. Because apart from technological, technological um, challenges, we'll need to make sure that business cases behind these cycles are also coherent. So both market access for recovered materials and price competition with raw materials, also in terms of water, will need to be taken into account at uh, the European level, I believe. Um, secondly, um, I would like to say something about uh, the lock-ins that uh, have been mentioned earlier before. I think it's crucial to avoid lock-ins in uh, infrastructural or technological choices. Um, as mentioned, technology is evolving at a, a very fast pace and there are a lot of opportunities coming with it, but also a lot of hurdles. For example, um, uh, an example of those opportunities are, uh, are reducing costs due to decentralization made possible by those new technologies um, and not only in less densely populated areas but also in the more urban environment so another opportunity are issues concerning emerging pollutants which we can tackle with those innovative technologies luckily um, i'd say both the european union and uh, flanders are investing in uh, in r d that is driving this evolution and if we want to move fast tackling administrative hurdles will be necessary. That is uh, something that has been stressed out quite often actually during the debate and therefore Flanders has also uh, a responsibility to take. Um, and we are tackling um, those those hurdles because it's uh, one of the actions uh, in, uh, in the Blue Deal. So I believe that it is uh, important that we try to reap the benefits from um, those technologies from those innovations, not only for ourselves, uh, our society, or our environment, as uh, Bernard said in, uh, in the end, but also in developing uh, export opportunities through these types of, uh, of innovations. Um, at the same time, several speakers have, uh, have pointed out that investment cycles stretch over many decades. So that means that the new directive will have to build in enough flexibility since it has to be future proof and therefore we also have to look at the surface model the service model actually of uh the water system and its uh, its operators um the similarities with some of uh, the discussions in the energy sector are, are actually very striking so it's clear that we should uh, examine how to adopt some of the solutions the uh, energy sector uh, came up with as professor rabbi mentioned uh, this part uh, is a part of a broader transition where we need to dare to think out of the box, something Aquafin is already addressing uh, through multiple uh, multiple projects. Um, last point I want to touch upon um, is the relation to uh, climate policies. Uh, like any other sector, we can and must expect that the water sector has to become climate neutral, something uh, Ms. Rosenstock also uh, said. I mentioned. Um, again, also here, it's a big challenge because not only um, the water sector involves uh, high energy needs, uh, but it also involves the climate impact of building the infrastructure, like for example, Syria. So we are at the very beginning of that exercise. Um, and I think that we did not hear uh, much about it uh, today, but I think it's clear that extra challenges uh, needs to be taken um, into account. And I think it was Mr. Van Herk uh, who made it clear that support uh, here is needed and, uh, and welcome 
So moreover, all I think that the um, directive um, as a legislation should be pushing for an, uh, an integrated approach um, and integrated solutions. Um, I'm see I'm running out of time, so very short. I will uh, like to conclude uh, with a few words on the on the further process since we are at the beginning of the drafting process, and I think it's good to see that there is both uh, consensus and uh, discussion on the topics that we uh, we want to tackle in this process uh, and of course I hope you all will be sharing your uh, your ideas and insights with uh, the European Commission by taking part in the in the public uh, consultation as uh, said uh, earlier by uh, by Ms. Rosenstock um, in Flanders we will be developing in further detail our uh, our position and for the upcoming months VMM um, will thus take uh, take the lead in the further process um, Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to, to end um, by saying that it is actually, as you might know, the, the Holy Week, um, not only for Easter, um, but only the Holy Week in terms of, of cycling, uh, with Tour Flanders this Sunday as, a, as an absolute climax. Um, and in terms of cycling, we could say that we already drove a, a spectacular parkour. But as you know, some hills are still ahead. Some of them are steeper than the others. And since we are in Flanders, we can also expect some 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 cobbles, uh, some headwind, and just like in a classical race uh, like the Ronde van Vlaanderen, the start is always easier than the final, so it will get harder. But when I hear the positive approach and the ambition of every speaker here today, um, I am convinced that we can also tackle these uh, these hills, these challenges, and that the updated directive can can guide us towards better waste management, based better waste water management, I have to say. Uh, in and during the next uh, decades. So thank you very much for um, for your attention. Thank you very much also for having me here. Thank you for the discussion, and uh, I already look forward for uh, to, to see forward your uh, your cooperation in the next weeks and uh, and months. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tom. Um, I just as I promised, I will be very short to conclude this session. Uh, we heard a lot of inspiring thoughts and uh, perspectives on the revision and the evaluation of this directive. Uh, I think we learned a lot this afternoon. Uh, it also was a nice experiment between uh, Vleva and the uh, Minarad to have an extra session on a specific topic. Uh, we can repeat it, I believe. And I hope to see you back in future sessions that uh, Vleva and or the Minarad organized uh, on environmental topics. For the Minarad itself, we will follow up uh, upon this development and this directive and try and produce, uh, be it a, a, a document for information or an advice in the near future, if that is deemed necessary and useful by our council members. I thank you all for participating in this afternoon and I wish that I see you back in a future occasion. Thank you very much.